Welcome to the Whole Church Podcast. Your favorite church unity podcast. Probably. If you want to hear from pastors, professors, and everything in between, right, sure. And, you know, the occasional train talk. Right, right, yeah. Uh, have we got the podcast for you. And thanks for listening to the Whole Church Podcast. This is your host, Joshua, and co-host Tiberius Wong. Teacher. Yeah. Um, before we start with anything today, we have um, Becky Walker, who's lead of the what's it, women's ministries mm-hmm. at Anderson University. We're going to start with that. But before we do, we want to read one of the comments on our iTunes account. It's uh, Shane Jeffrey. It says, long-time listener, first-time reviewer. Thank you for all your amazing content that you put up here on the site. It's super encouraging with two S's. So I guess it's super S- encouraging. Super encouraging. Yeah. Super. And uh, also yeah. with us is Erin Hardy. Hey. Yeah. yeah. She's been a ghost on the podcast before. Yeah. As guest host. Because she didn't really want to speak, but still wanted to be a part of it. And we have my fiance who refuses to speak. And, uh, yeah, I'm engaged. Tiffany, soon to be Noel. I'm going to make her attend. Her little name's Elizabeth, so it'll be T E N. It'll be great. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, we read the iTunes comment. That's uh, one way that people can see the podcast is anyone who comments on it, it allows more people to see it because there's more ratings and reviews on iTunes. I don't understand right. how iTunes works, it's but like it works a, like that somehow. It's like, a, you know, what's hot? Yeah. People are commenting on this. I'm showing it to other people. Yeah, that yeah. makes sense. Um, another way you could support us is on the Patreon. Right now we're doing the free giveaway for Kindle Fire 7. Not free. Uh, sort of free. It's $3. You support us, and you get all the other content, and then you just so happen to get a giveaway, which isn't really why they're doing the Patreon, hopefully. Right. Yeah. So we're still doing that, so if you want to support us, it's patreon.com forward slash the whole church podcast. Uh, something like that. Yeah. Before um, May 21st. Yeah. The link will be... In the show notes, and what what all do they get with that? Uh, well, when you support us on Patreon, you get access to our daily devotionals, our extra content, the uh, too long didn't listen, which That's my is favorite series. Yeah, <laughs> which is where we ask our uh, guests to summarize the entire podcast in ten seconds, yeah. and then we post that on the Patreon for people who may be too busy and like. We're also if you're just, just also it's you know, amusing. It is fun to listen yeah, to. It's really quick. Quick audio clip, and you're like, "Wow!" Like, I was, I've been really impressed by some of them. Right. One, one guy did it in four and a half seconds. That was Our my previous guest. Yeah. yeah uh, last week's guest. Yeah. That was fantastic. But yeah. Okay, so let's jump into today, where we're gonna start with a really deep question. So I might take some thoughts. So we'll start with it, and I'll right. kind of defer to you. Up. First one, just hard hitting. What's your favorite type of cloud? Right. Right. And by type, you mean like. Yeah. Type of clown like cumulus stratus, cumulonimbus, cumulus, or or you could just say like big shape. fluffy, mm, big bunny fluffy. shaped. Mm, got it. Yeah, I have to go with a big fluffy bunny shaped or something big, like uh, that. Camel shaped, whatever camel shape. Shape. Camel shape. Camel shape. Kind of into camels. Mm-hmm. So camels are yeah, yes, they are. I can't remember the last time I saw a camel shaped cloud. Uh, well, that would it, be. It cool. would happen. It but happened. It, can it have as many humps as you want? Does it, does it still count as a camel shaped cloud if it has like ten humps? Well, I think it, that's a stretch I camel. Think, that's a different area. Of- yeah, and one hump is a dromedary, and a two hump is a camel, I think, or yeah. something. There's there's oh, some well, there's a difference between the two, but I may I have a mixed they're up. They're both classified as camels. I mean, Sally the uh-huh. camel had a lot of uh, dromedaries are just like a like sub. I don't want to say sect. That's not right. Sub family. There you go. Okay. And uh, I just think people don't know the name that name for a regular camel because most people just call it a camel. Okay. You know, there it's you odd how often your biology major expertise kind of stuff yes. comes in handy on a. It does. Yeah. It's weird. <laughs> but uh, Joshua, what's your favorite kind of cloud? Yeah, I like fog. I mean, when it's fog, like nighttime yeah. and it's like foggy. Maybe you have like that one like yellow street line. I just like the serenity of it. It's kind nice. Of cool. yeah. Fog. Aaron? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I like when people post pictures of like clouds that look like Jesus. Those are kind of Jesus interesting. Jesus clouds. Yeah, you know. Okay. Oh. The ones that are shaped like Jesus. You know, right. like, oh, he's coming. I've you know? literally never heard of that. Really? You've never you seen like, people post like, pictures? Jesus Christ. Like, just like going clouds shaped like Jesus? Yeah. yeah um, okay. If you want to send your best Jesus cloud picture to or any the whole church at gmail.com, we would love to see it. About to Google my, uh, my favorite cloud is actually the uh, Asperatus cloud, oh. which is uh, the most recent addition to, well, not addition, but most recently named cloud in uh, you know the Meteorological Society. In uh, in 2017 was when it was officially named, and it's just like a really rough cloud. Like it looks like. Have you ever seen like a really close up picture of a cat's tongue? And it's kind of like rough. And it looks kind of like that. But Wait, are you talking about the one that looks like soft serve? What? Show me a picture of clouds that look like soft serve. 
And just like ice cream filling the sky. No. Well, what was that one? I don't know. Oh. It doesn't sound like you're describing anything. Oh. All right. But uh, yeah, Asperatus. It's uh, what was the it just last clip that looked really cool. I don't know that uh, you were like going to give an honorable mention to. Ooh, it was uh, Cirrus. Oh, it starts with an F. It was it was a really wispy cloud. It looked like uh, baby hairs. I think that's I what know. I was thinking of. Maybe. Yeah. It was cool. Uh, it looks like baby hairs when they curve up. Hmm. It was just a really wispy cloud formation. Hmm. That has a name, apparently. Awesome. Yeah. So, instead of introducing you myself, I'm just going to move away from the cloud stuff. Um, Aaron has known you for a while. Aaron is one of our writers on the website, Team Zao, and she's yeah been guest host before. Um, Aaron, do you want to introduce yourself and our guest today? Hey, I'm Aaron. He's already introduced me. And with us is Becky Walker. She was my boss for, what, three years? Three Two years? years? Three close three to years. that. Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah, she's the greatest boss I've ever had. <laughs> the only one. But I'm definitely the greatest. And so I'm going to let her tell her tell about herself a little bit. Okay. What she does, because she has so many titles that I don't even well, know them all. introducing you has been deferred twice now. Yeah, I know. I know, well, right? That's okay. You should that's okay. defer to them. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll let you. You want me to do it? Okay. You're, you're she probably, just, ha- she just do does better. so much <laughs> that it's hard to keep track of it all. I was her assistant for two years, and I couldn't even keep track of it all. <laughs> that sounds like you were a bad assistant. <laughs> I kind of probably was. No, she wasn't. <laughs> she was amazing. Oh, my goodness. I couldn't do it without her. So... Um, but I am the um, associate campus minister here at Anderson University and uh, work with women, specifically for women, which is nice. About 70 percent of um, all college students, but definitely here are women. So it's nice to have. Uh, I think that the school in, has invested um, time and energy in having a women's minister. So it's been really cool. Um, I, I help with other aspects of my job or helping with some of the ministry um, um like I do ministry houses, I've done camps, I've done some administrative stuff with things like a lot that. Of mission so, trips too, right? Yeah, tons of mission trips. Yes, we we go. We've been to Guatemala, Italy, Haiti. Um, getting ready to go to London uh, in the next few weeks. So. I forgot to tell you about the Jenkins, Kentucky trip. Yes, we, we do. We year. do a Jenkins, Kentucky trip every year, working with cool. with um, unwed mothers that are struggling with um, their babies being born and having enough to buy for them and things like that. So. Wow. So it's been it's been quite an adventure, twelve years doing that. So sounds like we could record a few podcasts today. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, we have time. Right? Yeah, we have, yeah we, we have plenty of time. No, no. <laughs> I mean, okay. So um, sweet, sweet. I did want to take time for some train talk. Oh, we're gonna do that now. I like train talk. Right. Yeah. <laughs> listen, listen. It's important. So there's a town in Florida. I don't have the article on, but right. we, we'll share the article link in the notes. But they've passed a law about having a quiet zone. This train goes through the town. It makes a lot of noise. keeps people up. They were all complaining about it. So they passed a law where it can't blow its whistle in their town. But then the legislation decided, no, that's, that's dangerous. So, yeah, no whistle. But we'll make the dings, like, for the crossing super loud so everyone still knows the train's coming. And I just found it really interesting because it's, it seems like the most self-defeating thing I could possibly think of. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I was actually raised in a train town, and oh, I no. actually like trains, and I like the noise, and yeah. it never bothered me. My grandmother lives in a train town. Yeah, I'm I grew scared. up in a train town, but uh, we rarely ever had trains. Uh, yeah, like it was, it was Inman, Inman, South Carolina. Mm-hmm. It used to be the peach capital of the uh, world, probably definitely the country. Mm-hmm. But uh, we had a super active train depot. Just apparently, not in the past twenty years. <laughs> Wow. Well, we were a crazy little town. It's, it was the hub of the Seaboard Coastline Railroad. Yeah, they have the Seaboard so, in Matthew. We just talked yes, about that on our okay. reflections yeah. mm-hmm. we did for the, yeah. on Patreon. So that's where I was from. So there was like tons of trains all the time. That's yeah. not, I really like trains. It's kind of died out now, which is kind of sad. But, but there's a cool train there. station there. If well, you ever they go also, through there. they are building a like mass train system for America. Yeah, I've heard and about so that. That'll be really cool. I hope it happens. Me it too. needs to happen. I'm following yes. on Twitter and doing everything possible to support Wonderful. that decision. I agree. I want more trains. I do too. That's all good. right. So that was train talk. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so do you have the article up that we? I want don't. To talk about? I can pull it up. Yeah, pull it up. we we had an article recently. I, I noticed from a lot of more conservative evangelicals were sharing and wishing their best to 
the family of, oh man, I can't think oh, of her name. Rachel Evans. Is Rachel Evans. About. Yeah, that, that's what I was looking for. I always forget her name. Uh, she just, she recently passed, um, had some heart problems, hospital stuff. And it was something we wanted to bring up, just, it was interesting to us because she's very, well, not traditional. She had the yeah. flu and then she had a severe allergic reaction to the antibiotics they gave her. Mm-hmm. And that gave her uh, seizures and that caused swelling of the brain. It was a whole thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, that didn't, huh. They induced a coma. Well, the heart thing did happen. It was a whole, it was a whole bad thing. Well, the interesting thing to me, she had a lot of debate online with like Tim Keller, John Piper, all of them, mm-hmm. because she's very progressive evangelical. Mm-hmm. She supported, you know, LGBT stuff in the church, and uh, she, I think she supported abortion as well. I, I might be wrong on that, but I'm not, like 95%. Sure, on that too. Mm-hmm. So it's really interesting that you know someone really progressive. They battled a lot, and then as soon as she passed, you know, they're all support showing there's so much support for her family and everything in them, even though they disagreed so sure. much while she was mm-hmm. around. And sure. I just like that. It's just a cool example of church unity. I think. Yes. You know, we talk a lot about hey, there's a problem, let's fix it. I just that'd be cool mm-hmm. to do a shout out for a moment where the church was really united and showing support in that area. I thought it was really neat. Mm-hmm. Right. Support to, um, she was so young. She was only 37. Wow. Yeah. And, uh, this was just tragic. Mm-hmm. You know, people have been sending their condolences to her husband, Dan, who was her high school sweetheart, college sweetheart. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's just tragic. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. But, uh, she also wrote a book called, uh, a year of biblical womanhood. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, uh, have you read it? I don't think I've read that. Really? Yeah. That sounds like something that you might, uh, I'll look into that look one. Because, yeah. uh, mm-hmm. she lived for a year strictly adhering to what the Bible says women, how Oh, Bible yes, says I've heard of that. Yes, yeah. I have. I have heard of that book. I, I haven't, haven't read it yet, but. I've just, you know, seen mm-hmm. some reasons. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I've heard of it, too. I, I never read it. And I, I mean, I guess I, I kind of confess, like, I just, not that I don't care about women's ministry, but it know. just was like, I have so many other platforms that I care about. I just don't think I really read too much about that mm. specific topic. Right. I struggled a lot with, you know, the whole should women be pastors thing because our the church we're a part of is, mm-hmm. supports it. And then right. uh, the college mm-hmm. I went to, a lot of professors didn't support it. So mm-hmm. I, re- I read up on it until I was like, I felt like I could make an informed decision where I stand on that. And then I was like, yeah, I think I'm good. Yeah. Well, I think, I think there's just you know, broad, broad perspectives on, on women in the church and what that looks like. And if you look at egalitarianism or complementarianism, those are the two terms that they use all the time to, right. to try to, you know, um, um, explain, you know, and I think a, a lot of, I think a lot of people sort of fall in the middle of those two theories, but those, you know, that's just my perspective. And, uh... Will you explain to us what those are, respectively, egalitarianism and complementarianism? Well, egal- egalitarianism is is more is more traditional um, roles of women mm. that we've seen in the past hundred years, I guess, right. uh, and earlier, um, where you know women um, are not to be in any any type of roles or um, you know th- where they're leading out that they they have more submissive roles in the church. Yeah. Well, what's it and. I want to say there's seven different times in New Testament. I may, I may have said that wrong. Submit. Yeah, I think yeah. I may have said that wrong. I think it's complementarianism that's that. Mm-hmm. And egalitarianism is more of a liberal view of... Mm-hmm. I'm sorry, I had that wrong. I apologize. But complementarianism is more the traditional view where women complement the, the, the male and the, and the church. Mm-hmm. And then egalitarianism where there's more equality, like you're, you're, you're more equal in your roles. So those are kind of... That's, it's a very broad... Um, definition of that but you know it's a lot involved in if you start studying this i actually which we're going to have the pastor of this church on too um crossway church where i went in mm-hmm. wilmington it was a non-denominational church they were adamantly against women in certain wow. leadership positions yeah i know they, they allowed them in like children's church and like women's ministry obviously no other ministry and they actually had like a huge debate on whether or not it would be okay to work somewhere where a woman was your manager and that was interesting to me. I don't think the pastor was ever in on that, but they did have a debate. It was just mm-hmm. interesting to me. That's uh-huh. kind of uh, terrible. Well, I mean, it is interesting. It, it's centered around, actually, I did want to read this too. It's centered around a Bible or group of verses in Second Timothy chapter 2. Mm-hmm. So actually, I'll, I'll go ahead and read that because that is most of the discussion about this particular topic kind of mm-hmm. centers around that. So it'd be nice to have that. Okay, right, so it's chapter 2, starting in verse 9. And, of course, I do New American Standard Bible because it's the best. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Good. I, I, like, I like saying that just because, you know, people can't argue back if they're <laughs> just listening unless they email us. Yeah. 
I'll read your arguments on the podcast if you email me. <laughs> we'll have a debate episode. Yeah, it'll be good. I'll just keep going back and forth with you until we have a full recording. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so starting in verse 9, it says, Likewise, I want women to adorn themselves with proper clothing, modestly and discreetly, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly garments, but rather by means of good works, as is proper for women, making a claim to godliness. A woman must quietly receive instruction with entire submissiveness, but I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet. For it was Adam who was first created, and then Eve, and it was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman, being deceived, fell into transgression. But women will be pres preserved through the bearing of children if they continue in faith and love and sanctity with, sanct with self-restraint. Wow, well, that's kind of those hard. Those were hard words at the end. Huh, we but it was a very, first, huh? like it was a very, you know, plain view from Paul to that church, which of course we get into a lot of argument on. Is that cultural? Is that like what's the context that in? How does that apply today? And there, there's a lot of like exegetical jumping jacks people like to try and do to figure out what to do with that verse. Um, yeah, it's it's highly but, highly complicated. Yeah. I agree. Well, what, what do you do with that? Well, um, I I grew up pretty much traditional traditional church and so i when i when i teach this particular course um i pretty much fall on the side of um i like for example i don't know if i could be underneath a woman pastor for me personally that would be sort of challenging um and and i've we've had we did have women deacons i felt like that was appropriate you know whenever i was growing up that became something that was popular and uh, women deacons were voting in, and I felt like that was accurate and appropriate. Um, I think that again, we're back to the broad spectrum of what all what everybody believes is is really so different now, and there's yeah. so many there's so many different perspectives, you know, on this. But um, I do think that you know that particular verse, if we look at the cultural context of those those times, I think that had a lot to do with it. I don't, I don't see that time as much different as this time that we're in right now, where people are, um, you know, we're seeing women coming to the forefront, being more, more opinionated about things, having, you know, we're seeing that happen finally. I mean, we're still, yeah. we're still sort of fighting for that in our culture, but we're seeing more and more of that. And so I, my feeling is, is that Paul was coming up against those kinds of things in the culture and the churches were as well. So Paul so, was against women speaking up more? Well, I think he, I think he supported women. I think he wanted, I think he wanted them to understand um, that the role of the church was was not a control factor, you know, but more yeah. of more of a place of love and acceptance and those kinds of things. And my perception is, is in that in that culture, there may have been a lot of controlling going on. Now, a lot of people going to hear verses like that or like opinions mm -hmm. like you know mm -hmm. not having with that first thought is how, how is it different than sexism you know a lot of people it's the question on the mind so could could you address that briefly well i think that um we we have to look at how christ treated women that yeah. to me i mean paul too i mean paul's works are in the bible and i agree with his his writings but i think we have to look uh what how did christ treat women i mean the first evangelist was a woman right and a sexually assaulted woman. So that's kind of interesting. She was the first one they told at the woman at the well to go and tell. Everyone else, he says, don't tell, don't tell, don't tell. And she was the first to go and, and you know, share with people. So I find that interesting that that, that happened in the scriptures. And so um, I, I feel like Christ is really our um, measurement, you know, of how he treated women in well, scripture. Actually, I always think it's really interesting that, like, if, especially if you think, culturally the bible has always been a lot more for women than the things around it were mm -hmm. and one, yes. one thing i actually i read really recently the archaeologically the earliest writings from the bible we found are the song of miriam and the song of deborah both works mm -hmm. from women mm -hmm. which are really interesting it's fascinating yeah it's absolutely fascinating but um yeah so and we're that, talking about paul okay. yes and i think i don't i think again i think paul's writings were were related to the culture that the yeah. church was in. Does that make sense? And I think there may have been, you know, the adornment and all of those things might have been associated, like if you adorn yourself that way, which was part of the culture, but that may have been associated with other cults or other groups. Mm -hmm. And I think he was trying to pull the church from not being like the world. 
if that if that makes sense. And so he wrote these things in order to help the Christian woman look look quite different from that. If that so, makes so sense, not quite a law. He wasn't saying any woman wearing pearls is going to hell. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I think he was really trying to to um, I guess you know create whole, you know holiness, which is separ- set, setting ourselves apart. I mean, we're part of the world, but yet we're setting ourselves apart. So it's like uh, this might be a loose loose analogy, but uh, the uh, uh, a swastika is originally stop, is originally a symbol of peace for uh, Western no Eastern uh, countries religions. Mm-hmm. Uh, they used it in Taoism. Even. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. Taoism. Like, I think it was originally a Taoist Yeah. Thing. And it was always meant to be for peace. Mm. But then Hitler decided to use the swastika to portray his movement. And all of a sudden, mm-hmm. that's bad. A swastika is anything. So you're mm-hmm. saying that Paul would be against us using swastikas today? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, probably. Oh, that, that's interesting. But it's uh, it's kind of like that. Like mm-hmm. these, this group uses those mm-hmm. to you know present themselves. Mm-hmm. So we as a group should not. Mm-hmm. It's like that. Yeah, I think it's sort. Of, I think it's that way. Well, I think that's sort of like we talked about this last week too. But uh, the whole law about tattoos and piercings. Yeah. They made that because back in that time, like having a tattoo was hey, someone did this to show that they owned you. Exactly. So it's like yeah, don't mm-hmm. do that. Don't look like a slave. You're my people. You're not slaves. Mm-hmm. And now that's a lot less relevant, yeah. right? I, I don't. Yeah, I don't look at a biker that's all tatted up. It's like, ah, I bet he's someone's slave, right? <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, that's not but you know, many line. people in the many people in the um, traditional churches do look down on that. Still, mm-hmm. many yeah. many of the people do. Yeah. You know, so it's kind yeah, of interesting. I've heard uh, lots of debates at uh, the summer camp that yeah, uh, we both most met of us at. Too. Mm. And uh, pretty much every year, someone asks the small group, hey, are tattoos unbiblical? And usually the answer comes out to be only if they're not in the glory of God. Because mm. yeah. well, that's, it's, it's really like the most non-offensive answer. Yeah. Well, what Dr. Link said last time is all things. He's like, that law existed. Same reason we have different laws now. It's who are you worshiping with what you're doing? Exactly. Well, I think it kind of goes back to the intent of the heart, you know, yeah. for people. Yeah. What is your intention? Yeah. You, you know, intentions. if women, and, and in back to this scripture in Timothy, like if if women's intention was to control, was to to be looked up to, was to does that if that's yeah. their intention? I think Paul was trying to say this is not the this is not what you're here to do. You know, your intention is to to um, and clearly submission is something we struggle with. You know, um, Eve struggled with submission. You know, Adam struggled with, I don't care. You know, if he had cared, he probably would have jumped in and knocked her down and stopped her from biting an apple. But indifference, indifference is like the, the greatest sin, you yeah. know. So, you know, we can't just l- ignore the fact that, you know, women, that in that particular scripture, that this might have been, an, in my opinion, my perspective, is there's yeah. that was an issue that they culturally were kind of coming across that way and he was trying to help the church not to have that kind of role. That's um outside of this, just as a grander picture verse I, I really like. So in Colossians, Paul's writing and he kind of does this struggle with himself throughout the book almost. Mm-hmm. You know, he's like, okay, so now we have freedom. We could do that stuff. And what does it look like? Well, God's got an order. So it still looks this way. And he paints an example. And like a lot of the examples are very much like, you know, women submit to the husband and this. And it's like really, Sounds legalistic to us today, I guess. But mm-hmm. he's trying to like struggle with this whole idea of God is a God of order, but also we are free now. And what does that look like? Mm-hmm. And um, near the end, in Colossians four verse six, it says, "Let your speech always be with grace, as though seasoned with salt, so that you will know how you should respond to each person." Mm-hmm. And if you look at the original language, instead of person, it could be situation. That word for that's like it, it's really vague. And that word which is. Yeah, Greek. Greek, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And then um, where it says, you will know, it's uh, perfect future tense in Greek, which which means it's like we're continuously learning this. Mm-hmm. So what it really looks like when you look at Colossians as a whole is Paul is saying, hey, God's got an order, but also this, and he's struggling with what that looks like in his culture, and he ends it with, y'all keep learning. Y'all keep figuring this out. Mm-hmm. And I think that is one thing, like we're still, you know, we're still figuring it out. A lot of American government today is still trying to figure out what what does this freedom I think look like in structured situations. Mm-hmm. So that's just an interesting observation. So um, that's where you know our church and a lot of 
I guess a lot of Pentecostal churches, other churches like that, mm-hmm. are, you know, for women pastors. Sure, sure. Yeah. Oh, so, yes. does bring me a question. How does, because I, I know we have, you said you'd be uncomfortable sitting under a woman pastor. How can we have church unity whenever there's something that big that we're just like, yeah, I can't have that? Well, you know, my question is, is it that big? You know, that's, that's my question. Yeah. You know, it really, I mean, like, is it that big? I think we often in, in our, um, in our Christian culture, you know, that we tend to make, um, a lot of issues debates and, and those are great. Like I'm not against debating. I think debating is healthy, but also I think, um, oftentimes we forget the, the true, the true meaning of what we're here for, which is not to debate, which is not to debate. It's to love and serve and find ways how we, how we work together as men and women to, to accomplish that. Does that make sense? Yeah, and there are many times I personally have had to be very, very humble and, and just have humility when I would go work in a church when I was 20 years old and they'd say, what did they send her here for? Mm-hmm. You yeah, know, our that's, that's pastors say, sorry, you can't teach anybody that's a, that's a male. So you'll have no males, uh, children in your Sunday school classes to teach. You want to have no males. And I mean, it's, it was a different time. This was That's years and years ago. I'm, I'm 55, 57, sorry, wow. 57 now. <laughs> and so, you know, there was, there was difficulty. I went to um, Southwestern Seminary in Texas and um, graduated from there with no job. Like there was nowhere to go. I, I wasn't a children's minister. That was about the only job women could actually. So, so that hasn't have. changed. That has not changed. You graduate college, you still don't. Know. You still don't. Yeah, exactly. It's <laughs> probably worse now. But for women, it was in ministry. It was very challenging. You could be missionaries. You could be, you know, there there were options like that. But like as far as like my my dream was to be like a state um, um, manager of deaf ministries. I worked with deaf people for like um, forty four years, 50, wow. forty five mm-hmm. years now. So uh, my goal was to be this, but even today, those jobs are still men's jobs. They've yeah. never had a woman in those well, positions. It's, it's an interesting situation because it's one where, like, government likes to step in and be like, oh, no, they're, everyone's equal, but, yes, yeah, it's religion, so they can't. So mm-hmm. it's a lot more, I don't know, it's almost like a lot more constrained because religion can do what they want. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. yeah freedom right. of speech results in a lack of freedom. Mm-hmm. ironically yeah in this case and there's a lot of lack of accountability i think sometimes in churches trying to ch- you know do do checks and balances on these things there's not there's not like someone saying well we have all men staff or maybe we need a few women staff you know uh same with same with even some of our our church organizations you know you'll look at the board of directors or the the presidents or whatever and there's lots of men you know and but oftentimes not women not blacks not asians not you know, so you wouldn't be comfortable with a woman pastor over you, but that's you me would personally. like to see women more in those positions. Maybe like, I think if that was if I think if they chose that, like if that's what you, I've I've, I've known women ministers yeah. and they've been highly successful, like yeah. the ones I've seen. Um, so I'm not you know for me personally. But for me to judge that is very challenging for me. Yeah. Does that make sense for me to sit yeah. in judgment that you shouldn't be a woman pastor when you're doing everything correctly and there's nothing in your character that's wrong or, you know, yeah. it's it's hard for me personally to be the judge of that. Right. That makes sense. And I think that's kind of what I see a lot of times. We are very, um, we scrutinize so many situations and we judge situations so much. Yeah. That we often lose the fact that this this person in this place is is serving and loving and past pastoring and shepherding people yeah. in a in a positive way. Where I may have a man pastor who doesn't do any of those things right. in a yeah. in a in a good way. Is is that making sense? Yeah, mm-hmm. I can say for um, me growing up with my dad being a pastor and my grandpa being a pastor, um, every church we've been to. My dad probably wouldn't, like, I mean, he'd be successful because he's a great pastor, but he wouldn't be as successful if he hadn't had my mom with him. Because anywhere we went, like, it's always seemed like as soon as we get to the church, the piano player would quit. And so my mom would have to take over. And there has been plenty of times that my mom has had to force my dad to just, like, not say something that he wanted to say. Um, because maybe it wasn't wasn't in the best interest of the church. But, um <laughs> Because sometimes that happens. But um, I can say, you know, she, my mom's not the pastor, not the lead pastor, but she's been highly effective in my dad's ministry. And she's been a huge 
driving force behind everything that my dad has done. So Mm -hmm. I think definitely women have a place, Mm -hmm. whether it's the main pastor or not, they still have, they're, they're still effective where they are. Yeah. (laughs) Wherever they go. Mm Mm-hmm. It's like the uh, the saying, behind every great man, there is a great or greater woman. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's right. I can't remember who said that. But I don't know. Yet, probably lots of people. look it up right now. Someone smart. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and women were highly supportive of Jesus' ministry as well. You know, okay. clearly, the, there are many characters throughout the New Testament that were highly supportive. And women were oftentimes very obedient to what Christ told them to do. Yeah. Well, if you look in Acts, I think it was, whenever they sent the letters out to all the main pastors in the area... And include uh, two women, but you know the debate is whether pastors or the ministers and you know, whatever. But right. We know that they were good positions in ministry from the very beginning of the church. Mm-hmm. So exactly. Priscilla and Aquila, Aquila. and Priscilla and Aquila. Priscilla and Aquila. Okay. I think that's yeah. right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that sounds right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that that's one yeah. that always interested me. And that there's there were some writings about Lydia being the being the financial support to Jesus' ministry because she was wealthy and had, had money. And so what I'm hearing is if there's a wealthy sure. woman who wants to support us on Patreon, <laughs> that, is, that is the most biblical option. There, <laughs> there aren't any in this <laughs> room. <so. laughs> so, if you find yourself with an excess of money, uh, we will take it off of your hands. There you go. <laughs> That's yeah, awesome. We yeah, got a new we, microphone. And a new notebook. Uh, TJ's yeah. anger that I doodle in our podcast. Oh, yeah. oh my goodness. I doodle in everything. The worst ADHD. Yeah. But, um, so, <laughs> what, what that did lead me into thinking, which I had already written down, you know, a lot of times we are put in these kind of positions where, you know, a woman's only teaching the girl right. children, mm-hmm, or, you know, mm-hmm. they're only in children's ministry, or women's ministry is separate from men's ministry. How does that, do you think that affects the community of the church? Like, we separate so many different times and so many different sects. How does it well, it's it's interesting. Um, if you look at the two most successful um, religious groups, honestly, the two most successful Christian religious groups, um, uh, or well, not really, one's not Christian, but you know, we're it's the foundation of Christianity, which is the Jewish culture, mm-hmm. and the um, and we find that the um, um, Amish. Have they are the most successful? Like only like ninety ninety five to ninety seven percent of those people leave their faith. Wow! In the Jewish culture and in the Amish cultures, and both of those have you know they have really kind of the complementarian view of women. You know clearly where women have a certain role and men have a certain role. So I and I and I do respect honestly the the Jewish faith and how they and we and I think we should as believers because it's the foundation to our faith um um but like they they're the way they present their whole uh, religion is based on more of a complementarian view and i think that's interesting that that has worked pretty successfully does that if that makes sense yeah and um it is yeah well the amish culture is directly inverse to ours Mm -hmm. most Mm -hmm. people these days are trying to spread themselves out as much as possible mm-hmm. to meet as many people as possible, mm-hmm. learn new things. Mm-hmm. And the Amish culture does the opposite. Right. It's uh, as close to isolation as... Yeah, isolationism. Nope. Isolationism as, uh, I think, Good a job. modern culture is. Mm-hmm. But their whole, like, this is an interesting message I heard about the using the table as an example. The whole The whole focus of their belief system is the table like being around the table. Mm, Even in the Amish country, they don't have church every couple of weeks. It's not like an everyday corporate thing. It's like every couple of weeks and they're, they're meeting with their families at the table three times a day. Plus they have, you know, special, special worship type services once a week and the Jewish culture, very similar. And we sort of lost that, you know, in our culture. And I think women kind of certainly, you know, have um, been, been part of that, um, establishing that. In the in the home, it's actually yeah, it's something really interesting. And you mentioned a lot of books like uh, Pagan Christianity or Letters to the Church that both talk about that. How like now that we have this church structure where we go and listen to someone instead of go and have church with one another around a table, there's a lot of different issues that seem to rise from that. And it's it's interesting that we don't just do both. Yeah, so I can yeah, definitely it's like too hard to do both things. I'm look back in my them. own life and see, and we stopped eating dinner together at the table. It's just like, hey, 
Right. Here's the food. Take it to wherever you want to go and eat it. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Or, hey, let's go somewhere and, and eat it there, which mm-hmm. I think that's... It's less private, so you're less likely to talk about real things, I feel yeah. like. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, Aaron can attest to this. The ministry that I do here on campus is mainly like one-on-one, like one-on-one discipleship. And I'll meet 8 to 12, up to 15 women a day. And, and I do one-on-one discipleship with them, which I think is really powerful. I think it's probably been, I tried small groups and I tried this and, and there's so many things that are distracting people from going to this group or this group or this group. But when you do these one-on-ones with people, um, with women specifically, I found it's been highly effective in helping them grow in, in a, in a authentic spiritual way. Does that make sense? Yeah. And and I think men need that as well. I'm I'm not I don't work with men, but if I you know, if I had an opportunity to, I would just say I'll speak this, for all men. Okay, you speak for all men. No, there you go. Yeah. Stop. <laughs> and so <laughs> but um but I see you know I see the churches sort of lacking in that. Like they're yeah. having, you know, big groups and they're having and they have some accountability some, but I don't I don't yeah. know. I just don't see as much of that. So I'm really it's an like advocate a, for that. Men mm-hmm. really are more interested in creating a net mm-hmm. maybe like one accountability partner that they'll tell everything to is mm-hmm. what I've found. Mm-hmm. But uh, observe. observe, yeah. And uh, women are more likely to create like a connection, like a rope bridge instead of, a, you know, mm-hmm. you know, just create like a, a, a trade yeah. network. Yeah, I would agree with that. I would yeah. agree with that. Yeah, it's interesting. I think two of the most powerful like church experiences was that when I was in Charleston, we had a small Bible group and it was a lot more like that net thing kind of deal. Yeah. And that, I think there was like two girls and like they ended up being like eight guys. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's mostly a guy, I think. Yeah, mm-hmm. We didn't make it a guy. Like, Anybody can come. I don't care who comes. We're just going to talk about the Bible. And it was, I don't know, it was one of the most powerful church experiences in my life was the like year and a half where we did that all together. And then um, another one, though, was just I've, over the last few years, I've had someone that I really respected move, move back from mission trip. They were on a seven year mission trip. Mm-hmm. And she's kind of become like a close personal mentor. It's uh, Christy Hager. I can oh, use her name. Yeah, shout out. Yeah. <laughs> but she, um, yeah. So it's crazy. Like, even, I think one of the most powerful, like, changing speeches, it was just a one on one conversation. We were on the way back from Disney World, and um, my brother and her daughter both went with us. They were both asleep. And she just kind of sat there and was like, hey, here's what I think about what you're doing with your life right now. Like, oh, no, I'm not prepared. I can't get out of the car. Oh, my gosh. I love Christy. Yeah. Yeah, it, yeah I mean, though, it yeah, these lot. raw, organic kind of conversations. And um, and I'm all about in, in those conversations, like, let's study the Bible and let's pray and let's all that. But more more intently, am I saying, what, what area in your character does not look like Christ? Like, how can we how can we work together to, you know, pick a spiritual goal and for you to work on being kind to people or, or, or stop the jealousy so you're not ruining your relationships. I can say any time so. that you and I were alone together, like at lunch or something, we could just be sitting there and she'd randomly go, now what's something you've been struggling with? Yeah. I'm like, well, I mean, yeah. Just to the hard stuff. Yeah. 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 Like, Absolutely. It would just be well, a lull. What are you struggling yeah, with? That, <laughs> what's something you think the church is struggling with? We well, I tell you, I, I think the biggest thing is our is scrutiny. Like, we just scrutinize everything and everyone. Sounds like that would get in the way of church unity. It, and love. So. It, it gets in the way of love. And so how can we love people well when we're always scrutinizing? Even even each other as believers, you know, we're scrutinizing yeah. each other all the time. So how do we, how do you know, how do we get past that? And one thing I've been focusing on, particularly this year, is like, uh, well, actually, this was last year's theme, but it's been floating over. But like theme in my life, but like forgiving quickly and often, forgiving quickly and often. So I think that's that's the way the church, you know, will get to a place. I think where they're finding themselves to have more um, releasing, release. We're resisting to release it, but this judgmentalism and scrutiny of everything is is huge, I think. And we're resisting to release it because it brings us, we think we're getting to control yeah. it, but we're actually being eaten alive by it. Yeah. And unless we release that and begin to love people well. Well, I have so. a lot of non-Christian friends, and I think that's pretty much what they think of the church is that that's all it is. Mm-hmm. So if, uh, so we're going to diagnose that as a big problem of the church right now. Mm-hmm. What's um, And it definitely gets in the way of love and church unity. What's what's something practical? Someone's listening. I'm trying to wrap up. So okay. What's something practical? Oh, someone's listening to this, and they're like, oh, hey, what can I do to fix this? What can mm-hmm. an individual person do today, right now? 
Well, I think in our own relationships, in our own families, in our own, you know, that's where we have to start in our own personal lives yeah. and say, what what area of my life am I judging people? What what place in my life? What what relationship am I judging? And how do I remedy that? You know, what what brings me to a place where I'm saying, you know, this is clearly a problem and I need to love this person. I don't have to like everybody, but I've got to find a way to love everyone. And so that's that's where I would go with that. So if every person does that, mm-hmm. what change will we see? So they start, they do what you said just then. They do it, they chase after it, they forgive whoever, love everybody. Mm-hmm. What change are they going to see in their lives and at their church? Like, What are the uh, ramifications of... You just wanted to use that yeah, word. Yeah, I did. Well, I think, I think, this, I think the result, what I personally see when, when we start working on, on things like this and this particular thing, I think, I think peace reigns. When you can forgive people quickly and often, this is something we and, desperately need. Yes, absolutely. And and also we we I'm just going to flip that around. We judge and, and and scrutinize ourselves a lot sometimes in a negative way. So so practicing right. that in your own life and and saying, look, I'm not perfect, and forgive you know forgiving yourself and forgiving others, loving yourself well in Christ, and then loving others well. What's Being, that whole commandment of love others as you love yourself? Part of that mm-hmm. is loving yourself. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Self detrimentalism has definitely become very, very prevalent. In yes, the past, it's I would become say almost popular. Five or ten years because mm-hmm. it's the easiest way to be funny. Yeah, mm-hmm. and there's it's such a lack like, of hope in that. There's no hope, and that's something you know. I try every day, every day. Like my boss, my recent boss is like Jesus wins. Like Jesus wins. Just yeah. keep saying it over and over. That Jesus wins. Me, it's like the the Toby Mac thing. He has a song, and then he does like. Ever since, it's been a long time since he's done that. All the pictures he posts on his Facebook and Instagram, all of them have that little hashtag speak life. Mm-hmm. It's a big thing. He's yes. just, doing, just yes, just speaking it. Yeah, we've got to give hope to this generation. There are so many of them, um, you know, I'm, I'm 57, so so many of the ones I work with are the next generation. And they, they're, uh, many of them walk around hopeless because of all the craziness that they're seeing in the world, all the things that they're affected by, all the things they're distracted by. And so my hope and my goal is like, less. Jesus has to be your source of everything. He has to be. And if you do that, if you rise above this stuff that's going on here, you'll live in his kingdom here on earth, not this kingdom. Wow. Yeah. That's a good note. Mm -hmm. I like that. So now uh, the last thing we do is our God moment of the week. It's something where we just talk about something that God's done this week that's made an impact on us or something we noticed in our prayer or just mm-hmm. something something spiritual. Mm-hmm. He gave thanks for, what was the oh, last time he gave thanks for the podcast? That, yeah, okay. that actually yeah. it? Mm-hmm. No, I think the podcast was my God moment yeah, but you, of you last the, week. Yeah, you, you have a bigger one this month. Yeah. You? Like a hundred ounce. Like a hundred ounce. <laughs> 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 go ahead, uh, go ahead and start, Debbie. So we went to the Circle K <laughs> on the way home from our last podcast recording. And uh, Circle K sells the most American thing possible, <laughs> which is a 100-ounce cup. And uh, That's I'll almost just, a whole 12-pack, right? Right. Uh, a 12-pack of 12 cans is, you know, yeah. someone can do math that's listening to this. Yeah. yeah. 12 times 12, yeah. Yeah. This is 44 ounces smaller than an entire 12-pack. <laughs> Insane. But uh, I, yeah, I give thanks to God for uh, providing, you know, such a blessing. Yeah, it's nice. Yeah. Uh, it's it's nice that era where you could have a to get one <laughs> refill every other day. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So uh, my my God moment of the week. Oddly enough, it extends from the last podcast. So I forgot how much I just love intellectual conversation, and I'd actually been thinking about it like. I remember one of the classes I had with Dr. Beck, he talked a lot about how one method of worship is through thought, just thinking about God, to meditating on things, God, and what that really meant. And he was like, yeah, scholarly thought can be a form of worship if you just do it, which, you know, we live in a very charismatic church where, like, worship seems very emotional-driven most of the time. Yeah. Because, you know, when they say worship, they usually mean we're going to sing some songs and people are going to be emotional for a while. I'm like, oh, huh. So I remember that really enlightened me back then. It's almost like, not, not that I forgot it, but that I hadn't been practicing it. And I don't know, just really spoke to me that there's a mode of worship that I feel more comfortable with, that I feel like I've been partially neglecting. 
And yeah, so I think God just challenged me. So my God only the week's a challenge, I guess. Yeah. To think more and be less dumb. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> uh, my fiance's here, and her God of the week is that we got engaged. All right, Aaron, <laughs> that was I was going to say it. You were going to say it? I was. This no. is my fiance Tiffany. That doesn't count. That What's your God week? moment of the week? No, we got engaged Sunday. It's been exactly a week. Yeah, so that was last week. Yeah. Well, you know what? It still counts. <laughs> but yeah, I'm engaged to okay. you. Yeah. Sweet. Lucky me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> lucky me. yeah, we have like a lot of cheesy face All right, Eris yeah. and everything. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I suppose my God moment of the week is a bunch of moments. Um. I keep getting emails of all the grades I'm getting in, and they're all pretty good, so that means I'm going to actually graduate this weekend. So, woo! Praise the Lord. Woo. Oh, yeah. Woo, woo! The last four years but haven't been fake. Did you get a 100-ounce cup in those four years? Did I get a 100-ounce cup? No. That sounds mm. like a four Might be a nice graduation gift for you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'll be expecting that this Saturday. Okay. So I'll roll around. up in there. <laughs> you would. <laughs> with, your, with, the, with the big cup. Hello, graduation. Yeah. And, uh, uh, graduation. Someone bought me a second one of these. For yeah, someone got that for... Me for like an engagement present? I'd be okay with that. Cool. Get two. Get two. Yeah, get two. Yeah, two. Yeah, Decorate it. Yeah. 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 I've also been told to say that this wasn't this week, but it was a couple weeks ago that I got a job, so that's good. I did get to visit my classroom last week, so that was fun. How cool was this? It was actually kind of lame, but I'm going to make it cool. I'm going to tell like, all make of those it amazing. students. I meant like 67 degrees, degrees, 70 degrees. I, cool you know, I felt comfortable I the whole time. I love the things that come out of your mouth. <laughs> Okay, I got a raise. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so that was raise. actually this week. Wow. Oh, I did realize. Yeah, I now, did find out. Now I know why he gave you the ring. Yeah. Because you got a raise. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. Yeah, she's going to be paying me back for about. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I did find out that across the board in Greenville County, all teachers are getting a raise. So that was good. Yeah. Oh, that's that's so yeah. Are you in Greenville County? Mm-hmm. Right oh, good. Yeah. That's awesome. So this has become the God celebration. Yeah, this moment. has become yes. a praise moment. Yeah, yes. praise, Woo-hoo. praise, Woo-hoo. Yeah, it's been Hallelujah. a good week, it turns out. Okay. Is it my turn? Yes. yes. Is it good? Okay. Yes. All right. Okay. The finale. The finale. Is I was riding. I was riding around in the cube about midnight. You know, because that's when I'm working. I usually work late at night, guys. Just letting you know. And early in the morning. I work here, that's and awesome. I, mean, I hang you just out with had another job somewhere. No, I just I work here all day until about eleven at night. So it's kind of crazy. But anyway, I'm riding around in the cube around eleven or twelve. And we pull in the parking lot, and there's all these people sitting in the parking lot. And I'm like, what is going on? So then I have my window down, and I've got people, I'm meeting with somebody in the car. And then some girl comes around the corner, and she's like, a girl just accepted Jesus in this parking lot. And I'm like, that's amazing. And so that's my God mom for the week. And that's so cheesy, oh, but praise. it's so cheesy, but I like it. There's so much praise. Yes, I like the yes. Now, was that the one who didn't just, like, do a praise thing? What? I think I was the one who didn't do a praise thing. I did, yeah, God challenged me once. Yeah, I should I should do a praise report. Do yeah, a praise I report. Praise. And Go she's forward. still talking to me, and that's that's my because <laughs> I'm incredibly oh, no. annoying. Yeah, so. I can vouch for that. Yeah, I'm impressed. I'm she's, sort of annoying. She's sticking it out. Oh, okay. Thanks. Plus, we did two podcasts this week, and I got to travel like a total of let's see, there's six hours there and back. This is gonna be about. Four and a half here, Meg. A lot. I think, yeah, it's a, a lot. lot. I probably drove like 12 hours. In the past weekend. month, we've gone to Cumberland Island, Georgia. We then went to Top Sail Island for a wedding. Oh, then we oh, went that's to right Tennessee. Have we been to Virginia in the last summer. month? I can't. Or was that I don't know Georgia? if that was. I don't know. But we went to Tennessee. And then, that's where did we go? Tennessee. We went to Charleston. Oh, yeah, I've been to Charleston twice in like the last week. <laughs> oh, my goodness. A lot of Y'all get around. Yeah, that's and awesome. for those who know we me, I chips. just love to travel. Oh, we yeah. had fish and chips. That's, that's my praise. That's crazy. Right. I really good food. <laughs> I got to have fish and chips. The Codfather in Charleston. Shout out to them. The Codfather. Yeah. yeah it's oh really wow. Cool. Yeah. That's it's really crazy. Like, if you happen to be like anywhere in this near Charleston, you should and like fish. You should go to the Codfather. Yeah, yeah, okay. That's the first place he took me when we went to Charleston. Nice. Yeah. yeah. It's also the the only place I took him to eat in Charleston. If anyone wants to go to Charleston with me, I'll I'll take you to the Godfather. I probably nice. won't pay for you, but you know, I'll let you pay for me. <laughs> yeah. Oh man, I didn't offer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. So, <laughs> so praises, praise wrapped up. Anybody else have any any more praises? I praise God for all the praises. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Praise. yeah. All right. So, do you want to start wrapping this up? Um. Yeah. Uh, follow us on Facebook if you haven't. Instagram. Uh, support us on Patreon if you will. We yeah, got the uh, the giveaway. giveaway, and the first twenty one until the twenty first. 
and we get the the daily devotionals with that. We do reflections of the week where we talk about right. movies for some reason, and also podcast devotionals. Everything we do on our weekly yeah, lives. Yeah, too long didn't listen. Yeah, that's a um, great series. Anything we decide to do extra, we will put on on the Patreon. Yeah, so I think it's worth it. Yeah, hopefully. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then um, also follow us on Spotify, iTunes, Google Play, anywhere you can follow us. Uh, if you leave a comment on Stitcher. iTunes, yeah, you leave Probably a comment like on two people that use that. If you leave a comment on iTunes, it allows more people to see us and see what we're doing, and they'll be like, oh, here's what's hot, and it'll be us, and that'll be weird for us, but it'll be cool. We'd appreciate it. And, of course, we read some of the iTunes comments on here, so. Even if you don't specifically listen to it on iTunes, just go to iTunes anyway and comment. Yeah. Yeah. Also, yeah. Re- definitely share it. That's yeah. all I hear yeah. about yeah, commenting just, just on comment. iTunes. Yeah, Direct that. message <laughs> us on uh, any social media platform. Email us at the call if you have YouTube my number. Com. If you don't have my number, it's I told them before, so just go to my apartment and shout outside the window. The window's usually up. I'll probably hear you. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, oh, if we you just have... want feedback. Yeah. Not, we don't want people to be like, oh, that was so cool. We, we actually want to hear genuine feedback. We read last time um, someone talking about how our mic needs to be better. We got to agree with them. That was cool. Yeah, he's right. Yeah. So, uh, all, if you have your own God moment of the week, please email us at thewholechurch at gmail.com. Yeah. And then, what are some future guests? Uh, future guests, we have Tim Coulter, who is the president here of the Church of the United States. Oh. Uh, also, the state overseer for South Carolina, George McLaughlin, Donald Whitney. That's one I'm the most excited about. The end of this year, we're going to have two more people that we think are going to be really good. Yeah. 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 His books are usually used in most colleges for their disciple classes and different stuff like that. I don't know, we used him in discipleship before I was in Charleston Southern. So. Cool. Um, of course, at the end of season one, we are going to have Francis Chan. Yeah, he just doesn't uh, know it yet. Yeah. yeah. He's oh. unaware. Oh, okay. We're just not ending season one until he agrees to be on the podcast. This, this could be years. <laughs> 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 All right, and uh, thanks for listening. Yeah, thanks. 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 Bye.